All right, you're all set. Okay, good evening. Seeing that there is a quorum in attendance, I'm calling the January 7th, 2021 meeting of the Town Service and Outreach Committee to order at 6.30. Uh, Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the Town Services and Outreach Committee. Uh, I'm going to call on each committee member by name to confirm that you can hear me and we can hear you. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Marcy Duma, yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. I'm here. And the town manager. Present. Uh, those assisting the meeting will be monitoring committee member connections and if necessary, we'll pause the meeting until we're re re reconnected. We request that everyone be patient with the process. Um, looks like we don't have any public present uh, at the moment. So we will skip the public comment, we have another public comment at the end, so we'll see if anybody shows up. Um, okay, action items. Um, we don't have any appointments tonight. And um, I regret to report that the um, Updated version of the town manager public way policy revisions is not ready to be looked at tonight uh, for review. So we are putting that off until probably the next meeting. Um, we, do our, we do have someone else now. Um, and uh, the third item on the action items is um, just let me make sure I, I'm not watching the hands here. Dorothy, do you have a question? Um, just a, a statement in reference to um, public uh, comment. Today, when I wanted to um, get the link or to look to check on the um, documents, um, I, I scroll down the new web page and I get to the committees and we weren't listed, but you have to press the little thing that says, see more. We were not featured amongst the listed committees that are meeting tonight. So a member of the public would not know unless they knew to go to that press, go see the whole thing that we were listed. So I, I, I found that a little not good. Do you have any, do you have any knowledge about that, Paul, or? Uh, no. We, the committees get listed uh, uh, chronologically. I mean, I, I see it on my screen. There are four, four meetings today and it, it's there for, on my screen. So maybe it's, I'm not sure what happened. I see it on the home page. Yeah. Okay. It, did, it didn't show up until I pressed see more. So maybe, thing, maybe things shifted or maybe one got kicked off already. Yeah. But anyway. Okay, we should take a look at that. Um, okay, moving on. The, the third item, which was um, um, added to an amended agenda, um, was something that the council president asked me to add to our agenda um, to just put out the question to the committee members whether um, whether we want to, as a committee, add anything to the list of future agenda items for uh, the town council's 2021 agenda. So I know we haven't had much time to think about that, and some of you may not have even noticed it on the agenda. Um, but if you have anything now that you know of that you want to bring up, you can do that or she, she has asked that we respond by the 20th, which is before our next meeting. So um, we could conceivably just, you know, send 
send your ideas and thoughts about that to me and I can pass them on to her. Um, so does anyone have any comments or suggestions at this time? So why don't we do that? Uh, if anybody, she just wants to know if there's anything that we want to add in addition to what's already on the future agenda items that would be specifically from, you know, related to this committee. So if you have any, just send them to me. Uh, uh, I would say, let's see, what's the date today, the 7th? So if you could send them within a week, that would be good. And then I can send them to her by the 20th. And maybe we won't have any. Um, okay, so moving on from there, we have our, our main presentation tonight is the um, stormwater management and IDEDE bylaws. Um, I did have a chance to talk briefly with the town manager uh, to get his advice about how, since um, we haven't looked at anything quite like this before, um, he suggested that we listen to the new updated revised presentation. Beth Wilson's gonna present it tonight then open it up generally to questions um, and then go back and go back through each bylaw section by section with Beth explaining each section and seeing if we have questions on each section. Remembering that GOL is also gonna look at it. So we don't have to look at, and finance is going to look at it. So we're only looking at issues of substance with regard to the bylaws. Um, and I shouldn't say only, we are the most important committee, obviously. Um, so, um, uh, so we'll just get started with the presentation. Beth Wilson of DPW is going to um, present for us. Can I ask a question, Darcy? Yes. So as I mentioned at the full town council meeting, and perhaps I can say it more bluntly now, it actually doesn't matter what's in this bylaw if it's what's required to be in the bylaw. So if we could focus not on line by line and understanding all the details, because honestly, it doesn't make any difference if I understand how most of the bylaw actually gets executed. What matters is that I understand what our decision points are within it. So the things that we have options about, if most of it is just, this is the way the bylaws are written in Massachusetts now, then let's cut to the chase and talk about the things that we can actually change. So if we could maintain, as I asked at town council, that focus rather than on each of us becoming an expert in stormwater management, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so go ahead, Beth. Okay. Um, well, thanks for um, listening. I want to thank the committee again for listening to this presentation on the proposed stormwater bylaws. Um, I know you, most of you, I think all of you heard the presentation that was given to town council before Christmas. Um, so this presentation, there's some, a little bit of repetition, but it, it, I tried to get a little bit more specific into the two bylaws. Um, so next slide. Uh, Amherst stormwater drainage system. Um, our drainage system consists of the catch basins, drainage swales, piping, manholes, and outfalls that carry our stormwater from developed areas to the streams and rivers, ponds, and wetlands in our town. It's maintained by the Amherst DPW, and it's also known as our Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, or MS4. In 2018, Town of Amherst applied for coverage under the 2016 Massachusetts um, General MS4 permit, which is administered by EPA MassDEP. Um, it's a general permit that they put together for all towns to apply for. So any MS4 community in Massachusetts um, applies for the same permit and has the same requirements. 
Um, and I said, as I said, Amherst was granted coverage in 2019, and the overall requirement of the permit is to develop a stormwater management program. Next slide. The stormwater management program, the overall goal, goal of our program is to investigate, monitor, and manage our stormwater um, so that it meets surface water quality standards at all outfalls. And to meet that goal, the permit has set up six minimum control measures, public education and outreach, public involvement and participation, illicit discharge detection and elimination program, construction site stormwater runoff control, stormwater management and new development and redevelopment, and good housekeeping and pollution prevention for permitty owned operations. And of those six control measures, three of them are required to have bylaws um, and they are required to be enacted by the end of June, 2021. So that's why we're talking about them now. And those are the IDDE program and the construction site stormwater runoff and stormwater management and new and redevelopment. Uh, so we've created two bylaws. One we, we call our IDDE bylaw and the other we're referring to as a stormwater management bylaw and it covers all the requirements of the construction site, stormwater runoff control and stormwater management and new and redevelopment. Um, next slide. All right, so the IDDE bylaw, basically it establishes that it's illegal to discharge anything besides stormwater into our stormwater system, our MS4. So that includes direct discharges such as dumping into a catch basin, illicit connections, which I think of as pipes that connect from um, say a commercial business directly into our stormwater system. It also establishes that it's illegal to either obstruct or interfere with the normal flow of our, um, our MS4. The bylaw, has language that includes exemptions. So those are discharges that are um, that are considered not illegal. One example of that is waterline flushing. Our DPW does waterline flushing of our, our main lines once a year, but I'm sure there's private homeowners who may have to flush their potable water line at some point and that is exempt. It's, it's not considered illegal. I'm not going to go through the whole list of exemptions. Maybe we'll do that you know, later in the discussion, um, but there are exemptions included in the bylaw. Um, the bylaw establishes the authority for illicit connection inspection, removal, and restoration. So it's giving DPW the authority to go onto private property to inspect for illicit connections. Um, it's giving DPW authority to um, suspend or terminate someone's connection to our MS4. That's illicit connection removal. Um, and then it gives the DPW authority to require restoration if there's been damage to our MS4 or at the outfall from our MS4. Uh, and the bylaw has all of that is the bylaw gives DPW the authority to issue um, written orders, and that's where these things would be communicated to someone. The DPW would issue an order requiring somebody to um, disconnect their illicit connection. Um, the bylaw includes an appeal process for people who are issued an order. They can appeal that order to the town manager. The bylaw includes language about BMPs, which are best management practices. It, it requires people who have some kind of a connection to our system or, um, or even a catch basin in their own parking lot, they're required to protect those connections. Um, so using things like uh, straw bales or, or wattles or matting to protect a catch basin that continually at a, a commercial business where 
a truck comes in and continually there's releases of of something into a catch basin the, the this bylaw requires people to protect any connection that they have to our system it also requires um, the notification of spills so if there is um, if it's a hazardous spill uh, the property owner is required to notify uh, Department of Public Works right away. If it's non-hazardous, um, the bylaw gives people until the next business day to notify DPW that there's been some kind of a spill that's gotten into our MS4. Um, and then the bylaw establishes a fining mechanism for those orders. Um, so if an order is issued, telling somebody to disconnect and they don't do it, there's a finding mechanism within the bylaw. Um, and then DPW administers and implements and enforces the bylaw and the bylaw will become part of our written IDD program. And I think, as I mentioned in the last presentation, the IDD program has a lot to do with investigating outfalls identifying ones where there is a pollution problem and then investigating the catchment or small watershed that goes with that outfall. And this bylaw will then give us the um, authority to investigate where the pollution is coming from and then have the authority to disconnect uh, any sources of pollution. Um, next slide. Stormwater Management Bylaw. This is our second bylaw. This bylaw basically establishes that stormwater management permits are required for new development and redevelopment projects and land disturbances and any disturbance, land disturbance, the uh, disturbance disturbs the drainage characteristics of one acre or more of land. Um, it, it develops, it, it has a, whole, a process where these projects would be applying for the permits and then it establishes that the superintendent of public works would either be approving an application or not approving an application. Um, it establishes again an appeal process. If somebody's application is denied, um, they can appeal that decision. There, <clears throat> there's exemptions again included. And the bylaw, an example of an exemption is land and agricultural use or uh, projects that involve the construction of utilities. Those are types of projects that are not gonna need to apply for a stormwater management permit. The stormwater management permit is all about the design of, a, of the stormwater system that goes with the, with the project. Um, and the bylaw establishes the creation of the stormwater regulations. Now, the, the stormwater regulations are going to are going to detail out this process of of acquiring these permits. It'll include information on uh, documents that would need to be included in the, with the application. So, what the DPW engineers would like to see in terms of descriptions of the stormwater system that's being proposed, so that they can review it and either also you know approve or disapprove the application so the regulations would include what documents and forms would be needed if there's going to be fees there will be fees with these applications <clears throat> the regulations will spell out the stormwater quantity and quality standards that need to be met by these proposed stormwater systems um, and those standards are going to have to meet the MS4 water quality and uh, low impact development requirements. Um, and then the bylaw establishes again that these stormwater systems that are being proposed for these projects, they have to provide how they're going to be maintained in the future post construction and also how during construction, construction site stormwater runoff is going to be has to be controlled. And that, so next slide. So 
So more on the stormwater management bylaw. It also establishes um, enforcement. Um, so it gives the authority to the town to cease and desist any of these projects. If if number one, they didn't get a permit at all, a stormwater management permit at all, or they are not abiding by the permit or the conditions that come with the permit. Um, if they're not maintaining erosion control during site con during project construction, um, and then it, and then they can um, this establishes that we can require remediation for any um, damage again caused by the project itself, and there's a finding mechanism. Um, the stormwater management bylaw has uh, gives the town the authority to establish a stormwater utility. That's something that's not required by the MS4 permit, but a number of towns across Massachusetts have established those. And, and we talked a little bit about this with town council. Um, it's, it is basically a fund that uh, specifically be used for the, the maintenance of our, our MS4 system, um, similar to the water and sewer funds. Um, and that is all I have for my presentation. And we can talk more about the details of the bylaws themselves. Very good. Um, do we have any council questions on the presentation? Dorothy. Uh, I'm interested in some context for this. Um, it's obviously a very elaborate system. Um, it's something that a good citizen would want for the um, security of, of water systems and land. Um, but I, I guess I, when did, when did Amherst start doing this? Uh, how many towns have systems like this? Um, I know that, well, I, I don't know. I, I'm guessing that many, many parts of the country have nothing at all like this and just let stuff go where it goes. So I'd like a context for this. Right. Well, well, our our stormwater system is pretty old because the town of Amherst is is pretty old. So the actual piping and and catch basins and manholes, uh, Guilford would know better than I. But I would say going back 30s, 40s or so. And uh, most bigger towns in Massachusetts have stormwater or stormwater or just drainage systems. Um, this regulation is, is relatively new. EPA started working on um, trying to permit stormwater system discharges in the early 2000s. Okay. Um, and it's, it's finally made its way to Massachusetts and, and been sort of really formalized with this 2016 permit requirement. Thank you, Dorothy. Alyssa? Um, just two things. One is that, and I'm sure you'll get into this with us, Beth, but unfortunately the slide presentation doesn't cover any of those decision points at all in terms of us knowing that ahead of time. So it, it's hard to us to, for us to read it within without that structure. I mean, it, it's perfectly lovely, but it doesn't tell us what we need to know to make a difference as to what we're going to be recommending to the town council. The other thing um, I just want to ask, and this is a town thing, not so much a department thing, is that when we get draft bylaws, they need to have a date in the footer on the draft bylaw, because the only way I can tell this is new is based on the fact that the label in the upload says it's new, but the word, the pages don't say anything about the fact that it's new. So that would just be really helpful. I think a footer would be great because it would be on every page, but however you do it um, to make it really clear that I don't have to depend on what the document was titled at some point when I download it. Thank you. Sure. George? Definitely. Yeah, just a couple of um, <clears throat> questions quickly. I guess one, first of all, um, does do these bylaws apply to the uh, university and to the colleges, um, or is it just to town property? UMass has its own MS4. Oh, okay. They have their own permit. Um, but but the but Amherst College and, and Hampshire College would be considered in this MS4. Okay. And and would the relationship between the university and town be such that that is pretty good 
I mean, what they're doing and what we're doing is in sync, or is it just like two different universes? And if it all works out fine, but if it doesn't, that's the way it goes. Um, no, we've actually had some uh, meetings with them in regard to stormwater and MS4. They've had their permit longer, so they've actually moved forward a bit more than we yeah. have. Mm -hmm. But one of the requirements of MS4 is to maintain what they call your the interconnections. So where one MS4 merges in with another MS, because that happens um, when towns systems end up connecting. So we have interconnections with UMass's MS4. Um, so we do need to, to work with them. And maybe a question more for Paul, maybe premature, but or maybe it's simply answered that he's confident that at, there would be good communication and cooperation um, between the university and DPW in this sort of area. And leave that to Guilford because he's, he'll be the communicator. Okay, all right. <laughs> Um, my understanding of the bylaw is that if you have, if you're doing something with less than one acre, so if you're building a house or developing a, a, a site, this bylaw or at least the uh, stormwater management bylaw does not apply. Is that in my Correct. reading? Right. Okay. Yes. And that's because it, the one, it's more quantity is what matters here, or is that just a freak of this particular bylaw? Why doesn't it apply to everybody? It, um, one acre? <laughs> right, so one acre is um, what's required by the MS4 permit. Yep. Um, other towns have gone smaller. There's there's towns that, that in their bylaws have, um, have permits for smaller lots, have for so half this, acre, there's there's some towns that have uh, you know would have two two different permits being issued, one for a smaller scale project and one for a larger scale project. So this would be a decision point. Is this something that we would? It, it can be, yeah. yeah, yeah. I know I wouldn't think of it. I can tell you that. Um, our, well. Impact. I think this is in the slide presentation, but I am I do have concern ultimately about. The impact on, of course, homeowners, but also business owners, uh, developers, and builders. And I guess this is something that comes later down the line where you reach out to them and communicate to them in terms of what new uh, requirements or costs will be connected with this. Is, is that part of this process, or um, is this really not going to cost anybody anything? It's just a matter of, you know, us making sure everything's done right. Um, they are. There is going to be a permit fee. Right. Um, and, it, and it definitely would be something that I feel like we would want to work with the, the developers and uh, contractors on that would absolutely have to happen um, just to get them used to the new process. So typically, you know, they go through uh, the planning process and maybe the conservation commission process and, um, and that involves submitting permit applications to those those offices with and those have fees and this would this is just going to be another permit you know in, in the process of getting permitted to to do a development project i guess i'm not expecting the fees to be anything that would gouge them compared to some of the other permit fees that they're right. already required within the town of amherst um but but just just working with them so that they understand the new process will be very important okay and finally, this last question really is maybe more appropriate for Guilford, but as you mentioned in your presentation, um, our system is very old. And I'm just wondering, as we look long-term at infrastructure, uh, piping, sewers, et cetera, I know we do it kind of piecemeal, and maybe that's the answer, we just do it piecemeal. Um, but I'm just wondering about the state of the system overall and what the uh, long-term plan is for it, if there is one. There, there is no, it's a good question. There is no master plan for stormwater at this time. Um, we take um, stormwater and deal with it on a, if something breaks, we fix it, but we also look to do stormwater repairs when we do major road upgrades, because when we're paving the road, we don't want to pave a road and then have a section of storm pipe fail. So we tie it in with our road, road work so that we kind of put it all together. We look at water, sewer, and drainage and see what needs to be repaired when we're paving paving a road so we actually get the best product. And that's kind of how we 
that's the, our, how we've been doing it in the past. This will now add a layer where we look at what the environmental impacts are, um, how much sediment's being added in this catch, catch, catchment area, how much E. coli is there now in the storm water, how much other bad pollutants, phosphorus, nitrogen, how much of those things are in the stormwater system. And those will add another layer where we have to examine those and then develop a plan to address the worst areas first and solve those with some type of um, treatment type system. I guess it, yeah, I, this is not a perhaps the time for this discussion, but, but the idea of a master plan, if that makes sense, what other communities do, um, it would be something in the future I'd like to, to hear more about, uh, whether it's feasible and if it were, how we would go about it. Um, since you're here, Gilford, just quickly, maybe you heard the question earlier, but the assumption is that we do have good communication with UMass and, and they're sort of, they're ahead of the game a bit, but that we and they would be in sync and what we're doing would be coordinated with them and you're confident about that? Um, you're asking if I'm confident about it. Uh, yes, UMass exists. Yes, the town of Amherst exists. We also exist with uh, Mass DOT who has a permit as well. Um, it always comes down to us trying to make it work. Um, sometimes we're a little out of sync, but we do tend to get back in sync really quickly. So it, it will work and we will be able to work together and it will it'll be fine um but like every once in a while we have a hiccup but we work it out do you have any more questions george uh for the moment no thank you uh i would just say that um you know i i um i think that george's comments about um, a master plan make sense. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, where you have a, 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 a cutoff for um, when new construction is required to, to uh, apply for a permit, the acreage amount. Why, what's the, what would be the purpose of not not requiring it for everyone. Um, I the smaller, you know, the the smaller a project is, um, it just becomes becomes a, I guess the more people it, it would involve everybody it becomes it becomes a larger uh, project for the town to take on. Really, you know, it'd be, it'd be more permitting um, if you if you took it down to half an acre. You would obviously be needing to review a whole, whole lot more applications that came in. Um, I've always I've thought of the one acre as uh, what the permit established. What many other cities and towns across Massachusetts are using. Like I said, there are some that have that have gone more restrictive. Um, it is really an area for discussion. Um, and so the state law is uh, allowing towns discretion in that area. Right, you, any, you have, it has to be at least one acre. If, you, if the town would like to be more restrictive, that's, you're allowed to do that. Do we know the, the number of lots that we have in, in the different areas, like how many lots that we would have that are less than a uh, one acre? I don't know well, that. It, it actually, it, the majority, I would guess, right? Well, it, it actually depends on the project. It's not, it's not actually the lot acreage size, it's the acreage that's disturbed. So you can have a one acre lot and disturb the whole site and you have to have a permit. You could have a one acre lot and only disturb a quarter of it and you wouldn't really need a permit. So it's based on lot disturbance and ground disturbance, not basically how big your lot is. So it'd be hard to figure out who, how many people might be affected because you could also have a, you could have a 100 acre parcel and only do half an acre, you wouldn't need a permit. Okay, one other question before I move on. Um, 
when we go on to the next step of looking at the bylaw, is there a way that we can go through it and um, in a way that Alyssa suggested that um, where we can kind of ascertain which parts are required by the state law already and which ones, what are the decision points or how, can you, do you have an idea, Beth, of how best to do that? Um, I'm just looking at the bylaws right now, you know, things that, things that, uh, that I would, areas that I would think you would be interested in are sort of the applicability sections of, of both of the bylaws and even the lists of exemptions. These are areas that you can expand on if, if, if you're interested in expanding on them. Um, I think what could what I can also go through them and highlight areas that you know I feel like are decision points and and you and get the bylaws back to you with sort of those areas highlighted if that helps. Um, you know, certainly there is a lot, especially in the beginning of the of both bylaws that is nothing that you would need to focus too much on. So well maybe committee members can give feedback on that if you have more comments. Um, Evan. Yeah, so I have a couple questions, um, some of which are to just understand it better. Sorry, Alyssa. Um, but so one is the, the illicit connections. I was sort of confused at points. Is it just connections that go right into the MS4? Because sometimes it seems like it's just ones that go into the MS4. And sometimes it also seems like connections that go directly into a water body. Like when I'm walking down the street and I see folks who have, you know, their, their laundry water piped out directly into the stream, right? Is, is that part of this or is it just if it goes directly into the MS4 system? Yeah, this bylaw really only applies to the MS4 system. What you're talking about there actually applies better under the wetlands protection bylaw because you're discharging directly into a wetland. Yeah, th this bylaw is really meant to, to protect our, our MS4 system. Yep. Um, and then in the stormwater management one, we've been focusing a lot on the, the one acre, um, but then there is that section um, that says, activities that affect less than an acre but could adversely affect the municipal separate stormwater system um, may also require a permit. And I guess I'm curious who's, does that mean, if, if you were someone, if I was going to build a, you know, something that was only going to disturb a fourth of an acre, how do I, I what's the, pro, right, if it disturbs an acre, we know. But if it's less than an acre, someone determines it. I don't know if it's Guilford who just like looks at the project and goes, yeah, probably you should get a permit. Um, but I'm sort of just curious how that works because there's, that's an area that seems very discretionary and I don't know how other communities have handled that. That's a good question. Um, so you want me to take that, Beth? You can take it. <laughs> so, so now the way that works is, is most of those are caught when they go through site plan review or some type of permitting with planning and they have to get a permit from the town to connect to the drainage, the existing drainage system, like you're connecting truly to a pipe or to an existing pipe system. And those are the ones we look at and we'll actually make a decision, you know, can you connect to the pipe system or you have to upgrade the pipe system to connect to it. So we would probably use the same guidance we're using now for anybody who has a smaller project and needed to connect directly to our pipe system or to expand our pipe system. If you have a smaller project, but you need to extend a storm drain up to the project to help you with your stormwater management, that might require a permit because of the pipe, uh, the system expansion. And that's how we would look at it. And that's how we look at it now with uh, the planning department and the town engineer reviews most of those. Okay. Um, and then just a couple more. So it sound for the, the um, IDDE one, it sounds like it's pretty much just if there's a direct connection, right? So I was looking at the exemptions and I was thinking about things like if you were to, and this is just hypothetical, right? But if you had like a little parking area at your, you know, 
multifamily housing place and you got a bunch of fertilizer all over it, right? From, from fertilizing the lawn and that gets washed into the storm sewer. That wouldn't be considered, would that be considered an illicit discharge or are we really looking for, I know it's sort of non-point, but really point illicit discharges? No, I mean, that, that sounds more like the first description which is considered dumping, sort of a direct discharge into a catch basin. Okay. Um, if, if it's a large enough fertilizer, um, that, that would fall under that. That's, you know, it, you see somebody dumping a bucket of wash water from a restaurant right into a catch basin or like what you're talking about, a whole pile of, of say, fertilizer accident washes into a catch basin. You know, if it's an accident, it happens and it, it kind of falls under that you must report a spill. Um, if you continually do it, 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 it becomes an issue. So, yeah, that that's dumping. Okay. And I think last question for, for now, at least, um, I was rereading the memo um, and under, and this sort of gets to decision points and next steps, but under next steps, it says uh, that, you know, this bylaw authorizes the creation of rules and regulations. And then it says, however, they, uh, they, the rules and regulations need to be drafted by June 30th. However, they don't need to be fully approved by the town council. Does the town council have to approve the actual regulations that are promulgated under this? That is more a Paul question. Yeah. Paul? Yeah, no, typically the, the, the council, the legislation would give the authority to the town manager to set rules and regulations. That's how this would set up. That was my assumption, which is why that sentence sort of struck me as, as out of ordinary. Thank you. Um, so this is uh, really for uh, to both of them. I'm not quite sure what kind of projects trigger this. So I'm going to assume that a major construction project um, would, but um, uh, this is to Guilford was it two years ago when we had to redo the sewer pipes all the, from my house all the way down to Sunset. It was a big project and involved catch basins. And since it's on a downhill, I assume it involves stormwater. Um, I have no idea what permits we got. Was that something for which a permit would be gotten in the future? Uh, yes, it would because um... Usually um, when we do our projects, we try to keep them to a small size so we don't have to apply for a general permit with this uh, federal government right now. Mm -hmm. So that's, we didn't, we kept that project small enough. We didn't have to trip the federal government permit. But now when we pass this bylaw, even town projects, we will have to apply for the permit that says, you know, we're disturbing more than an acre of land. And um, almost most of our projects are over an acre. Um, so we mm -hmm. would end up filing for permits. But my project probably was not an acre. So, or, or when, I don't know how an acre is measured in fact. When, when, your, when your project was done, the limit was five acres. Uh-huh, okay. So then but the next question is, um, what if um, just say even on the same block between Lincoln and Sunset, a lot of people decided to put tiny houses in their backyard. Um, and so it's a lot of people doing a small, you know, half acre, quarter acre. I don't know how much um, a thousand square feet house takes up. Um, would a lot of people doing a little thing end up triggering this thing, or would that not? I mean, it because it, it certainly could cause a lot of change in what's going going into the stormwater. If they're done as separate projects, mm -hmm. over spread out over time. The way it's written right now, under and and it's all under an acre, they wouldn't um, need to get a stormwater permit. Okay, but should they, in terms of protecting the environment? So this is related to should we do as some towns have done and you know do lower um, acreage? Um, it could have an impact. One thing that the is more of an impact here is the increase in impervious area. Um, right. Okay. Parking lots, um, 
are have much more of an impact on stormwater management than tiny houses. Um, so. Okay, that's that's a, a a good reminder. Thank you. Yeah. As, as a follow on to that, that's where some communities have built their stormwater utility. And the stormwater utility is based on how much impervious land you have on your lot. So if you have a tiny house, a parking lot, and a regular house, you have a lot of impervious space. So you would be kind of charged more for having that impervious space, where if mm -hmm. you only had a house and an unpaved parking area in your, drive, in your property, then you'd pay, you would pay less. So okay. there, in the future, there is a way to kind of address the growth of impervious area and try mm -hmm. to reduce it and try to convince people to install more um, water quality type things and more um, methods for improving the water quality from their individual lots. So that could be something that could be addressed in us like the stormwater uh, utility if we make one of those. Okay, thank you. George. Just a quick follow up, Guilford, did your avoidance in the past of the federal permitting process is, is I take it designed to avoid the expense, and I assume that's time, which may be the major expense, but also are there fees or have uh, fees attached to it? Or is it mostly just the time that's required? And it, I, I get the sense, and you probably expressed this in previously, and I just wasn't listening, that part of the message here is this is going to cost the town some money over time. It's going to be more expensive. Um, I was just going to cost uh, developers and maybe homeowners occasionally because of the permit fees, but it's also going to be an expense to the town in terms of, of time. Um, and perhaps do, do we pay fees when we do our permitting to this, the feds or to, or is it just the time involved and that's, that's the cost? Um, most of the time we don't have to pay a fee to the federal government or to the state government. So um, five acres was a really good project size for our projects. It didn't really um, cause a lot of inconvenience for the neighbors and so forth. So we tried to, we kind of were just under that limit just because it was a good limit to be under. As we go to one acre and as we've gone to one acre in the federal system now, um, we do have to get those permits and we do apply for them. It's not, a, it's not that big of an issue for us. It's something we have to do, so it does take time, but um, it doesn't cost much. We just apply for it and get the permit and move on. Uh, I have one more question about um outreach and education. In that list in the slide deck, there were, um, I think, five bullets, three of which were required to be put into bylaws. Um, but I think one of them was outreach and education. Is that correct, Beth? And, right, yeah, that's... Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, based on what Guilford just said about um, you know, trying to encourage developers and homeowners to have, um, you know, to have less paved area and so on in, on their um, developments or on their lots. How would that, how do you foresee that that would be conveyed to residents and developers to encourage them to do that? Yeah, right. So the program has a public outreach and, and involvement um, requirement to it. And uh, we've already established the stormwater web page. It's under uh, Department of Public Works. Um, and it has, um, it actually has tabs for developers and then has another tab for residents. It has a tab for commercial businesses. Um, and if people go to the web page and they click on those, those tabs, there's, um, there's references to to low uh, impact development. There's references to types of um, BMPs. There's um, there's all kinds of there's uh, flyers and fact sheets on there for developers and as I said for commercial businesses. Um, so that's out there right now. Um, we've been doing uh, mailings so far. More of a focus on residential education at this point. We've been doing mailings on grass clippings and dog waste, um, that kind of thing. Um, we did do one public announcement on the on the on the town webpage last spring 
for contractors really about construction site runoff. Um, the way you're talking, so in terms of the change in the, the permitting process, um, that would definitely be reaching out to all developers and contractors that we sort of already have contacts with through um, inspection services and places and, and the planning to educate them on, on the new permitting process. Um, so there's sort of two, there's, there's the education that's more environmental and there's the education on, on the upcoming changes in terms of permitting. Um, but the environmental side of it, we're really required to just continue to do that kind of public outreach um, forever. You know, there's that we're under the permit, there's, there is some specific requirements like you need to send out something having to do with dog waste to uh, with dog licenses every year. Um, so there's certain particular things we have to do, but then also we have um, the ability to do whatever we want. What I'd really like to do is have a catch basin painting project started up. I actually had started to work on that with the middle school environmental group last March, but then school closed. So that didn't work. And I've been working with Hitchcock Center on some educational educational things that all have to do basically with stormwater uh, water quality. So if we wanted to go to that web page, um, is it uh, under the DPW or where is it? Yep, it's under DPW stormwater. Okay, uh, sounds good. Alyssa. So just to follow up again, talking about that memo that we saw at town council and that was in our packet again, um, I really appreciate that it provided the context of East Longmeadow and Northampton. That was really helpful. So thank you for that. Um, and it also points out so that we're remembering in terms of these decision points, conversation that I've been focusing on since we talked about it at the full town council is that we don't establish the fee schedule. The town manager does that. So obviously it sends a message to people as to how much they charge, right? Northampton charges considerably more than East Longmeadow does, although it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence in their two charts. And so I think, you know, from a policy standpoint, perhaps we say, you know, maximize the fees, right? But we say that about a lot of things, um, but that's not actually something we're going to be recommending in terms of dollars. So when we're talking about whether we come out of this conversation tonight with the thing I hoped we were coming into this conversation with, which was the highlighted sections that we could make decisions on, I wanna be clear what I mean by what we can make decisions on. I don't mean Beth and Guilford thought it was a good idea to do it this way, thus leaving the town council two choices. I wanna know the state law says you have these choices Beth and Guilford thought these made the most sense to us. Now you have these choices. This is like the conversation we have with town council all the time. There are times that, that we wanna do something different than the town attorney wants us to do it. It's not their recommended choice, but it's still something that's legally defensible. So I just wanna be really clear who's making what decisions. If most of this bylaw is actually a creature of decisions having already been made, then I wanna understand why those are the right decisions to have been made. If it's mostly a creature of this is the boilerplate Massachusetts uses and you only get these tiny little fractional places you can make a decision and here's our expert opinion and then we say, yay, that's a great expert opinion. Of course, we don't question that. That's great. I just think we need to be super clear on who's making what decisions when as part of developing this bylaw. So um, unless other people have questions or comments, that seems like a good segue into <laughs> what we're going to do next. Um, uh, we were thinking that we were going to just go through the bylaw section by section, but maybe it does make sense to get a highlighted version um, along the lines of what Alyssa was just suggesting. Uh, just to see which parts are definitely mandated by law and which are decision points for us. Um, does that sound feasible to you, Beth? Yeah, no, that, that sounds great. Would, in addition to that, would you want sort of examples from other towns? So, so at a decision point, such as like 
like a, like fees or even just acreage. Um, what I can provide is is the highlighted sections in the bylaw where there is some real decision points where things aren't mandated, but then also provide a couple examples of, of what other towns have done. That might be helpful too. Like it would be helpful. Is there anything that we could look at tonight that would make sense to, um, you know, that was, um, you had mentioned a couple of different sections that were definitely decision points. Would it make sense to look at them just to give us a preview of what's coming or, or not? Um, Guilford, you're, sure. you're about to say something. Oh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll pitch in. Um, <laughs> to tell the truth, most of what you have for the bylaw is kind of meant to be the rule. So that in the, when we get to the regulation, that's the point where people can talk and make decisions more. So if you really look at the bylaw, the places that you could, the places to make a decision are, do you like how section C is? Do you want it to say in the bylaw what the minimum drainage area is, or do you want to just move that to the regulation and then you don't have to keep changing the bylaw every time you want to change the size or what size land it applies to. Um, exemptions, if you want to not have the exemptions in the bylaw, you can have those in the regulation only and just authorize us to come up with exemptions in the regulation. So C and D are things that you might, if you want to, you could tone down to and put in the regulation so there's more discussion at the regulation point. Administration, we kind of laid out how we kind of manage the stormwater system now. If you wish to change that, this would be something you could look at changing or adjusting. And then enforcement, you know, you don't want me to do cease and desist orders. You want me to do something else like plant flowers or something like that. Those, those, that would be something to think about in that section there. Um, so really we try, we did try to strip it down to make it meet all the requirements. And then during the regulations, we could add more stuff in and we can have more discussion about how we wanted the regulations to function. So um, those are the only four sections I would see that there's stuff that maybe you might wanna move to the regulations or even beef up now. Those would be the two choices. Yeah, I can just say that um, we, we have until when to do this. June? That's a bath. Well, we have to get it back. Oh, oh, yeah. I thought you meant since town council gave it to subcommittees, when do they have to report back to town council? Yeah, um, I, I think we're supposed to report back within 90 days, but um, okay. But we have um, we, until that, June 30th, yeah, the end of June. Right. So um, we have a pretty packed agenda for the next couple of meetings after this. So. Uh, and we don't have anything else on this agenda, so it might make sense to go through some of those sections uh, now uh, to give us a preview. And um, I'm just thinking that we, we need to, it makes sense to, to, for, to me to do it now. Um, so if we could, could, could uh, Beth or Guilford or whoever is good at screen sharing, <laughs> pull up the, the uh, Paul, Paul, you have a suggestion? Yeah, so I was gonna say I could share as well. I've been, I'm, um, I'm working on the document and adding the footers, things like that, that you've asked for. So what I wanted to say was um, when, you know, town attorney has taken the first look at this, um, said it looked very familiar. It looks like a lot of other um, bylaws that many other communities um, have developed. I mean, we steal from each other and that's sort of how this wasn't made out of full whole cloth. The other thing I did is I tried to put it into the format that the council has utilized for its bylaws. And I think, you know, Beth and Guilford already found a, a typo in there that I have to fix um, and trying to match it up. 
Uh, the one thing, the one decision point for the council, and it may not be this committee, it might be GOL, is sometimes the purpose and authority. The purpose sometimes, uh, I think it, the, the overall comments of the bylaw um, were that we have, you have the data block up front. Um, you, whether you need a purpose section or not is debatable. And that's a decision point for the council, whether you want a, a, um, a decision, that type of thing. And, try, and I tried to structure it and use the same, I'm not very good at the formatting piece, but I tried to use the same kind of formatting that uh, other bylaws had used, so. Okay, so section A is what you're talking about. Right, but I think that's probably more, I don't know, I assume that's GOL is gonna make that decision, yeah. That's more of a GOL issue. Uh, so could we scroll down to, is it um, C that you thought we should start with, Guilford? Uh, yes, I think B is the, sorry, it's jumping on me. I think B is, um, is definitions, definitions, right? You got a lot of. Right. A lot of definitions yeah. and um, C is applicability. Can everybody right, see that or should I make yeah. it bigger? Yep, so let's take a second to read it. So the decision points here might be the one acre issue. The one acre issue and even just issuing permits. You know, these are the, the as Alyssa was trying to hit, what, what does the permit require us to do? The, re, the permit really requires us to establish some kind of a bylaw that gives the town the authority to to investigate and monitor and manage our stormwater that's in our stormwater system so that when it comes out of the outfalls, it meets water quality standards. How we do that is not necessarily spelled out so much in the permit itself. So such as even issuing stormwater management permits to new and redevelopment projects. Again, as Paul said, this is this is really based on on templates that are out there and, and what other towns are doing. But it is something that if the town didn't even want to issue any kind of a permit, you're not required to. It's just the way most towns are doing doing things. But the state is requiring doesn't require permits. They no, they don't require. They don't require you to to establish a permitting system for new and redevelopment. Uh, George. Yeah, um, the question I'd raised earlier had to do with why you know less than one acre. And as we look at this, and I appreciate sort of the overview, and this is a decision point. It seems. Um, as I think Guilford pointed out, or maybe Jeff did, that it does uh, give uh, authority to DPW to uh, act in, in, in areas where it's less than an acre. And I, I believe as Guilford said that this usually comes out anyway in the, in the site plan review process. Um, so to my mind, and also I, the thought, I got the impression that doing less than an acre might create a headache for um, DPW in terms of just the number of sheer number of permits they'd have to deal with. So if I feel at the moment looking at this that, and I'd be glad to hear opposite from, from Guilford or from Beth, that um, to avoid just tons of permits on the one hand, but also the fact that you have the authority according to what we have here to intervene in cases where you feel it's necessary, um, this seems to accomplish what I saw as a concern about, well, why, why is one acre um, the cutoff point? It's not really the cutoff point, um, but it is for permits, unless you feel it's necessary and that seems to cover it. Is that a fair, incoherent description of what I'm reading? Yeah, it, yeah, it is. Um, 
guess I'd be satisfied with this from that perspective. If, if, as long as you guys are happy with it um, and you do have the, the authority to intervene where necessary, and there is obviously established processes where you would be informed, you would be aware of what's going on, um, and to avoid um, excess permits that would just add more work for you that often wouldn't be needed, this seems to, to be a nice compromise. Dorothy. Uh, I'm asking about the normal maintenance improvement of land and agriculture or aquaculture use. And um, I'm thinking of some instances which we may not have in this town now, but we might in the future. Uh, hogs, uh, large chicken places, and possibly even cannabis. Um, I know that hogs and chickens can cause terrible, terrible uh, runoff problems in places where they have them as like, you know, big business. Um, would it be safe to put something just in case those things got increased or is that something that we could add a regulation later without there being a problem? I think you could add, add a regulation later, but I think large scale production of farm, farm, farm things like that actually fall under the zoning bylaws. And if you have a large scale hog production, um, you would fall under that and then you have to go through the planning process as well okay. as. Oh, and then also you, they may, they may hit some of the other um, national pollution discharge elimination system permits, um, you know, industrial facilities such as our wastewater treatment plant has its own stormwater discharge permit because it's an industrial facility. So a large enough farming facility okay. would may be required to have its own permit. Okay, thank you. Evan? Yeah, I wanted to follow up. So um, I was surprised to hear that the, the actual stormwater management permit is not required. Um, and so I guess I'm curious, and if, if you know, you know, if you don't, you don't. Um, is that the most common way that towns or municipalities have have responded to this? And are there other routes that they have taken that is not a, a permitting approach to this? Yeah, I haven't seen any other any other way to do it. I mean, they basically required you, you, you to review projects that are at least an acre for the standards that the MS4 includes for water quality and um, water discharge from those projects, you know, you need to review it and approve it in some fashion. It's just that they, as I said, they don't come out and tell you exactly how to do it. And so some towns have come up with, with more than one, uh, basically permit, but you know, some permits for, for a smaller project, some permits for larger projects. Um, yeah. And if, if, if I could follow up. Um, so, and I just want to make sure I'm understanding this all correctly. So the, the permit, so you would get prior to approval of the plan and the permit would, would deal with stormwater management, both of the site as a construction site, and then also management of the site after construction. It's one permit for both construction and post-construction, correct? Right, correct. for post-construction, con post what would be, included in your application for your permit would be sort of like an operations and maintenance plan for your stormwater system in your project. So you would be providing, when you're applying, you'd be saying, this is the maintenance of our system that we're gonna do post-construction. And that would be approved to get you to even get your permit. Okay, and then just, just one more. Um, so it only applies to new development and redevelopment. So, so existing parcels that are perhaps like 100% paved, are those just unregulated until and unless they get redeveloped? Right, there's nothing that we, yeah, there's nothing where we can do at this point for that um, unless they are again falling maybe on more under the IDDE bylaw and right. having some kind of a discharge directly to a catch basin that, that right. we find is a, is a problem and is, is producing pollution at the outfall. 
but otherwise if there's if there's an area that's just parking lot impervious surface terrible for storm water we can't do anything about it and actually if they do decide to redevelop then we actually can regulate storm water right okay right. make sure i understand that correctly although when we start if we start talking about a storm water by uh, storm water utility those are the areas where you can actually start addressing things that don't fall in the construction redevelopment phase and you can say well since you have this big parking lot and you're making so much storm water you have to pay us or your fee is higher than someone who doesn't and that would drive someone to start redeveloping it and making improvements to it mm -hmm. that makes sense yes and also um again with the utility and this program in general publicly owned land that has large parking lot schools um our proposed parking air parking lots and things um you know you can use this program hopefully you know money through the utility to make those uh, using this the best green infrastructure that that we can that we can find paul Yeah, so I, you know, we were talking about this here, and you know, some people live in Belchertown. They just got their bill for, and it's, they get a stormwater bill for the amount of impervious surface they have, and for their stormwater utility. So there, are, all, all of our neighboring communities, or many of our neighboring communities, are doing this. Alyssa. So just having worked on bylaw review, um, when we were trying to make our bylaws make better sense than they had in the past. So this is more of a GOL thing. So George, this is your problem, not TSO's problem. But the applicability section doesn't really flow. The part in the middle belongs at the beginning or the end, because the reality is issuant, prior to issuance, you need X and you need it either because you're under the circumstances of one acre or because you're under the circumstances of discretion of public works. The way it just is all one giant paragraph with the part about the permit in the middle is just not helpful. So we're trying to do better and this may read the way one of our old bylaws read, but Evan and I couldn't fix everything with the other people on that bylaw review. So it would be great if that could get broken up because one of the complaints we hear obviously about our bylaws is that there's a lot of large blocks of text and they're hard for people to follow. I know that we have people who basically hold people's hand throughout the entire process when it comes to all our different bylaws, but to make it a little easier for people, I think that would help. Paul? You're done? Okay. Um, one thing that I would be interested in finding out um, as far as other communities, and maybe you already know this answer, Beth, is whether um, if, if the state just requires the one acre minimum, um, what other communities do? Uh, are there other communities? Is do most communities just adopt the one acre um, minimum, or is you know? I just like to, I'd be interested to know if there are other communities that have adopted a a, a half acre, quarter, three quarters of an acre, or whatever minimum. Oh, I think we lost Beth. Oh. I, think, I think we lost Beth. Uh oh. Yeah, we, we can we can look that up and we can give you that information. Okay. Any other comments on C? Maybe we could scroll down and take a look at E. Uh, I'm assuming there's more than one here. Yeah, D has seven. A lot of exemptions. Okay. So let's take a second to look at these exemptions. George? 
This is probably due to the recent uh, experience we've had with Berkshire Gas, but I, my attention was immediately drawn to C, uh, to three, C3, or D3, I'm sorry, construction utilities. And it mentions best management practices. And I'm just wondering whether that's just, you know, how do we know <laughs> or do we? We, we do know, I mean, we do have, oh. they, do, they do have to get a permit now to be operating in the town way. So um, when when our inspector is not home because he's sick, he, um, or a home on vacation, he or sick, he um, he's out there and he usually keeps track of what's going on and can keep good good control over what the, is going on and make sure things are going on. Um, and then we do talk to the contractors. So it's not something that just kind of every once in a while, it's usually a fluke of why it breaks loose and something happens it's not supposed to. Guilford, do we know that the timber, the Forest Cutting Practices Act regulation uh, somehow um, regulates stormwater drainage? Yes, it does. There's a whole section on stormwater in the timber harvesting rules. Okay. Uh, Dorothy. Um, so back to um, the, the utilities. Um, so I, we learned in the email from Donna Zucker that they removed a crab apple tree. I will assume that they had to remove the crab apple tree. But in such a case, is there restoration? Yes, in the case of that crab apple tree there, the tree was declining in health and the tree warden gave approval for it to be removed with the understanding that they will replace it. Okay, thank you. Melissa. Help me out on the single family aspect. I understand a single family versus an apartment complex, but a duplex, for example. I mean, plenty of duplexes would have no significant difference over the size of a, of a single family home. Many of our single family homes have been turned into duplexes, more or less. So what's, I understand that single family home is an easier, single family dwelling is an easier thing to define, but I'm just wondering why we're choosing that rather than leaving more options there associated with for the obvious example being a duplex. Yeah, I think it was just just the thought that you know duplexes and triplexes uh, as you go up the it's a, usually a, a larger area. Um, the landscaping and gardens and lawns would just it would just get to be a larger parcel, um, and so then they start to yeah become a little more commercial, almost like so they may we may want to regulate them more than a single family house. Well, th this, is, this is an exemption. So we're exempting a single family house from having to get a, a permit if they're doing landscaping. So if you have a, a single family house on two acres and they're making a, they're landscaping an acre of it, they don't have to come get a permit. That's what this allows them to do. Right, I'm just trying to understand why somebody with an in-town duplex you're saying it'd probably be such a small lot size, it wouldn't matter. Perhaps that's my solution because I'm thinking of duplexes that take up a relatively large amount of the parcel because they're much, are much older um, dwellings. And it sounds like in that case, if they, since they'd have so little area to re-landscape anyway, they probably wouldn't fall under the need to have the permit in the first place. So that's how their exemption would come about. Yes. All right. Evan. Yeah, actually, since, you know, if we're sort of providing feedback for revision, that one also caught my eye, because um, I guess I just wasn't sure in, if, if an acre of land is being disturbed and it's a single family home versus an apartment complex, I'm not quite sure why that distinction matters. If it's two acres being landscaped from a single family home and two acres for an apartment complex, it's still two acres being disturbed. So I, I was I was curious why. And so um, 
it, this seems like a weird distinction to me since the impact in theory would be the same regardless on the type of dwelling. So I guess I was curious if there was a way to reword that or also if we if if we even feel like, you know, putting an acre and a half garden in um, would even require a, a stormwater management permit, which, you know, from the fee schedule that we saw for some of these other towns in theory could be quite expensive. All right, uh, you know, I think it's exempt partly because of what the, what the actions are, you know, landscaping and, and gardening um, may have less of a chance of, of creating a whole lot of runoff that could end up in our um, stormwater system. Um, the thought of adding in duplexes or triplexes is it's actually a, a fine idea and thought it would still be the same type of activity, which is almost a low impact type of activity. I guess if I, if I, could, I, I was actually less focused on that and more thinking, do we even, I don't know, it, maintenance of existing landscaping gardens and lawn areas to me seemed like it would just be an exemption on its own, regardless of what type of um, house is attached to. So I'd be curious, and I guess I'd be curious, it, it, you know, um, if we are looking at comparisons of other community communities, if, if that's common, because it seems like if I have an existing guard, if someone has an existing guarding, maintaining it shouldn't be subject to a stormwater management permit, regardless of what kind of dwelling it's adjacent to. Yeah, we can yeah. No, it's, it's, doing. Gilford? We, we can look and see what other people are doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested in this, uh, the same issue in that, um, you know, an ex very high percentage of single family residence owners fertilize their lawns. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know, most lots are half acre to an acre, I guess. Um, or I guess there are a lot of smaller smaller lots than that too. But I guess I'm just interested in knowing um, why we aren't concerned about that. We we actually are concerned about that, and we go and if you go and look at more into what's the education and outreach program of the permit, there's a lot of uh, emphasis put on talking to people and existing uses of chemicals for lawn care and um, that type of thing as well. So that's covered more of a maintenance type and in, in, in the uh, outreach and uh, education side of the permit than it is in the stormwater permits right here. This is more, this is actually more geared towards you're ripping up something and you're gonna redo it and you don't want the lot to wash away while you're in the middle of construction. Right, I guess right. though, if you, we wanna prevent a lot of toxins from going into our stormwater, the, you know, the, there's a huge amount of our town land that's just owned by single family residence owners and a vast number of them are are uh, fertilizing their lawns and so <laughs> it seems like that that is a that is a pretty big issue um, I think I think just about everybody in my neighborhood is fertilizing their lawn everybody but me and I have just dandelions all over it <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, I, I would like us to have less, less toxins in our, in our stormwater myself. Right. Any other, well, any other? Go ahead, Beth. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, part of this, this program is identifying all the outfalls, mapping all the outfalls, sampling all the outfalls. Um, and where we find elevated levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, then we need to investigate the catchments. And if it ends up in your neighborhood, <laughs> then we would 
know that your neighborhood has an issue with nutrients and um, and that's where we would really start to push some kind of educational campaign. And explain to me, um, I, and I, forgive me if I'm asking a dumb question, but um, how the how the the drainage from the you know the runoff from the from the toxins in the um, in the lawn treatments get into the stormwater. They would typically um, sheet flow off of a yard and go into a catch basin in the road. How do they get there, though? Well, when it rains, um, you know, the rain is going gonna, gonna to flow through a grassed area. And, and if it had just been fertilized with the inorganic fertilizers, the they'll, the dissolve into the rainwater, which a lot of some of it was is going to sheet flow off of the off of the yard and get into the catch basins in the street. So it would have to go onto the road, into the pavement, into the grate, and into the into the stormwater. Right. Catch, because there's otherwise that would be the only entry way. Um, any other questions um, about the exemptions? Okay, so we got administration. Can you scroll down a little bit, Guilford? Is there much more left here? Alyssa? Just, and I, I know we'll talk at another time about more of our options here, but just, a, and again, maybe more of a GOL question, George, but just in terms of my previous work on bylaw review, I don't think we want to include the part about an administration about how the town manager has to develop regulations within one year, because that immediately makes this bylaw out of date at some point. And we don't, we try not to do that because then it's a question of, well, shall we now revise the bylaw to say the regulations got written? I, I appreciate that obviously we want regulations, but it says here that if he doesn't do it, it doesn't actually suspend or invalidate the bylaw. So that seems more like just something he'd let us know that he'd done rather than something that belongs in the bylaw itself. The only reason I could see putting it in the bylaw is to say that he's the one that's required, that he's the one who does the regulations, but I wouldn't put the time limitation on it because again, you're going to make the bylaw immediately out of date a year from when you adopt it. Mm -hmm. 
Could you scroll down again, Guilford? So what does the appeals of the action mean? A decision of Guilford shall be final. Further relief of a decision made under this bylaw shall be reviewable in compliance with section G5 of this bylaw. It's actually G7. <laughs> that was yeah yeah no g5 had, oh it is g5 you're right oh maybe appeal oh, to the so i don't think it makes sense to say the decision is final then um if it's not if it's appealable it's not final right it's usually it usually means that the permit is I, I make the decision on the permit that's the decision on the permit and then if they don't like it they can appeal it but most people don't appeal it so otherwise everyone would ask the town manager to, all the time for the to be the final decision of the permit but so but you shouldn't you it isn't correct to say that your decision is final if it's appealable right Oh, I mean, DEP uses that same language with their permits to us. They'll issue a final permit. This is the final permit and it's appealable through, usually through going to court if we want to go through court with them and it's laid out that way. Well, but this appeal is just to the town manager, right? So um, I guess I'm just saying that that doesn't make sense to me to say that it's final unless you're trying to trick people <laughs> into thinking it's final. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I think it's a legal, a legal way of saying it. Yeah. I mean, the next sentence simply to, and then the next sentence informs you that you can appeal it. So, I mean, it's, I don't see any concealment here. It's just a way of, of a way of putting something. I, I don't see a problem. Yeah, that seems a little crazy to me, but, um, yeah, any other You're right, Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> of course I'm right. <laughs> um, final should mean final. <laughs> we say that with DEP all the time and we lose. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just a, an attempt to deceive the public, I think, which is not a good, good thing for us to be doing. But, um, any other comments? Well, we could take this up in GOL. It's a legitimate point. Um, you're adding to my list, but I don't mind. This is helpful to me. Um, and we could discuss it at GOL. One solution would be striking that sentence. Appeals of action and then just go further relief or just yeah. relief um, and just strike the sentence. But that's something GOL could take up. Sure. Yes. Um, you still want to say that you that Guilford is the one who makes the decision. So somehow you have to say that. Well, you can say it. Guilford makes the decision and it's appealable. Um, so um, any other comments? Uh, so I guess I'm interested in knowing from people, what are what what makes sense for our next steps? Um, oh, do we want to look at enforcement here?
Shall we scroll down a little bit? George. It's a very small point under 4F. If the enforcing person it strikes me as somewhat an odd phrase, but maybe that's just standard language. Um, the enforcing person, I assume, would be an inspector, or it could be, any, I mean, it's just right. So it says, if the enforcing person determines. What's the issue, George? Yeah. Trying to understand who an enforcing person is, but I guess that maybe just means the inspector or the DPW inspector or whatever. I don't know. And we and when because throughout the rest of the bylaw, it's uh, superintendent of public works. We can we can just put Guilford in there. <laughs> and you guys see throwing on the. <laughs> You're basically, you know, what in doubt, put, what in doubt, put Guilford in. I just wondered, I just, yeah. uh, it's not a big deal. But, I think uh, that's a GOL issue, George. Thank you very much. You're, keep your hat on the right, in the right committee here. <laughs> I'm taking lots of notes. Thank you. <laughs> um, any other comments? Okay, it's 8.06. Um, I am not completely sure when this will come back to us another time. Um, are you, Beth, does it seem to you that we've made comments that would, um, where, that would require some revisions. Um, does it make sense to come back with a revised version? Yeah, there's definitely, there's a few spots there that I can definitely make revisions based on the comments. Um, and so we didn't really, we didn't go through the IDDE bylaw. We only looked at the, the stormwater management bylaw. Yeah, I, I don't know. I we have a few other things to do tonight, and I am not sure that we have time to go through the whole thing. Yeah. Um, that's fine. So maybe and on a future agenda we could do the other bylaw. Um, we have other comments here, George. So have we hit the decision points, or is that something that we're, we would, uh, upon return of Beth and and in Guilford, we would then look at the highlighted decision points, or have we pretty much covered that? I would, I would say we need to come back and hit the decision points. We'll highlight them and bring them back to you and say what they are, what we think they are. Yeah, if you could do that with both bylaws, that would be good. Um, Alyssa? Yeah, I'm just feeling bad for the fact that staff is here and we're going to have to drag them back to another meeting. But if we simply don't have time for them to highlight the things for us in the other bylaw, then I guess we don't have time. Um, the other thing I was just going to say is that this is, there's enough GOL meet here that I'm wondering at what point does, is it simultaneous and what point is it separated? Because if GOL is going to make a bunch of revisions, that none of those are going to be substantive. I, I'm just trying to be clear on how that's going to work. But I understand that if we are actually going to get a chance next time to whenever that next time is to highlight the actual changes, then I can understand that GOL is not going to bother messing with it until after we make those decision points. So just trying to be clear on what we're doing and also apologizing for staff that we weren't able to get to both of these tonight when you took the time to come tonight. Okay. 
Evan? Yeah, actually, I wanted to echo, I feel like, I mean, staff is here. I feel bad if Guilford and Beth have to come back again just for the IDDE that we may then send them back for revisions for. And so I guess I'm wondering, since we've all read the IDDE bylaw and we got their presentation, if if we, we spent more time on that stormwater one than I think we needed to because we said we were only going to go to the decision points and talk about them, but then we ended up reading the bylaw in full and asking questions and then delving into a lot of GOL stuff. So is it possible for us to just do a quick decision point summary of the IDDE to give them some feedback so that we don't have to, we can minimize the amount of times they have to come back here? That is fine with me. Are people okay with going over tonight slightly if we have to? Because this will take us over our time, definitely. Yes? Well, my brain is hurting. Um, I actually have found this much more interesting than I thought it would be. So I guess I'll just grit my teeth and continue. I think it's partly due to Beth and Guilford. Uh, you guys have done a great job. Um, I wasn't looking forward to this. Um, and now I'm starting getting a little interested, which yeah, just that's love a sign it, right? of, of whatever. So yes, the answer is yes, let's, let's just do it. Um, quickly, GO, GOL will, will not look at this until you're done with it, until we're done with it. All right, so let's put up the other one and and just uh, run through it. And, uh, okay. So we have our purpose that GOL is going to look at, right? So before you start with this one, um, just a comment that there's really no regulations that go with this bylaw. This bylaw is the meat of the meat of what you're approving as the regulations, basically. We'll take this and then we'll put it into a program where we actually explore and look for the illicit discharges throughout town. So this is the, this is the document. There really won't be another regulation that goes with this, just to let you know. Okay. Right, Beth? Right, right. So are we, should we assume that GOL is going to look at the purpose section? Yes. And, and is, is B definitions? Yes, you can probably skip to C. Okay. Or even D. Hmm. Uh, George. Sorry, that's a residual hand. Let me get it down. So there, there is a section under D that talks about the regulation that you know the, the, the town manager may develop regulations, um, but as Guilford said, there's there's not as much. Um, needed with this bylaw in terms of getting more specific about processes, which is really under the stormwater management bylaw, the permitting needs to be spelled out a lot more and, it, and they need the regulations. This bylaw, what it covers, it, it, it really covers everything just right in the bylaw. It doesn't need an expansion into regulations, but I think it's fine that that's in there under D, D2 in case in the future, we decide we do wanna create some regulations. Mm -hmm. Could could one of you uh, kind of explain E? So the purpose of putting E in there? Someone has to answer it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, 
uh, something that you know, came from sort of the you know, templates of these that are out there and what other towns are putting in. And the, the way I read it is that um, these the standards set forth here. Um, uh, uh, it is, it's kind of legalese. It just says that, that you, even though you follow these standards, you could have discharges that are not right. standard in Palooka. And it's just kind of, yeah, it's the legalese way of saying it. So for example, you you were following a minimum standard of, and say, for example, you had a one acre standard, but then there was a, a horrendous discharge in a three quarter of an acre uh, uh, parcel. You're just stating that the, the fact that you have adopted a minimum standard doesn't mean that we're not going to have pollution. Yes. Right. It might also suggest that you would still be legally liable. You could, that, you could say that yeah, because, I'm wondering about that. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't say that because I fulfill the uh, requirements of this bylaw, I'm not, you know, legally liable for something that I've done. I'm just, I don't know. Right. You know, this, this bylaw deals a lot with the, with the discharges. So say somebody met the rules of, of using a BMP to protect a catch basin. So they thought they were meeting the rules, but then like, uh, some kind of a large release occurred on their property. Um, it doesn't sort of exempt them then possibly from having to pay for restoration or, or remediation or something. I mean, GOL could ask for a legal, um, you know, ask the lawyer um, for an explanation if you feel it's necessary. The committee does. Uh, Alyssa. This doesn't need to be answered tonight, and I was hoping it would become clear to me, but it's not. So if you could just try and explain it next time. Under prohibited activities, items one and two. Item one, illicit discharges, any pollutant or non-stormwater discharge, except as exempted in section G. Then illicit connections, starts out and I understand what it's saying about, hey, we don't care if you thought you were grandfathered in from 1937, not true anymore. But the last sentence of illicit connections specifies conveying sewage. So are we saying that the only possible thing that's an illicit connection is a sewage illicit connection? Because otherwise this doesn't quite make sense because if there are other kinds of illicit connections other than sewage connections, I'm not sure why we're calling out sewage in the last sentence of item two. So again, you don't have to do it tonight, but it, it just doesn't scan for me as to why sewage is called out in one sentence, but illicit connections I assume could be broader than, uh, you could have an illicit connection that conveys something other than sewage and that you're not supposed to be doing that either. Right, right. The illicit connections is for for any kind of pollutant. So yeah, we can we can look at that sentence. Just, yeah, finesse it a little. That'd be great. Yeah. Dorothy? OK, so um, I'm just finding it confusing because I understand now that this one is non-stormwater. And what we were just talking about before was stormwater. But you look at the top of the page and um, it, the, the fines and stuff, it, there's a lot of things that looks the same. And it, it, they both say penalties for violation of stormwater management bylaw. So the stormwater by management bylaw includes non-stormwater. I'm just saying it's really hard to keep the paper straight. And is there a better way top. to label or title the papers? Or did I totally miss the point of everything? This is illicit discharge. <laughs> There's a typo in the one that you have, I think, Dorothy, and, that, and they fixed it. Oh, it says, so it doesn't say, say penalties for violation of stormwater management by law? Right. That was a typo. Oh, okay. Here, here, it's on the screen now, Dorothy. 
Okay, fabulous. <laughs> because, you know, I'm sitting here with these papers and finally I see inside it the thing that makes it different. Great. Thank you. Good catch. Evan? Okay. Yeah, um, in F, so just a little bit of a confusion. Um, I had asked earlier if this bylaw was really just supposed to cover um, discharge into the MS4 system or if it also covered discharge directly into water bodies and it said only focus on the MS4 system, but then F1 says into the MS4, into a water course wetland resource or the waters of the Commonwealth. And so that I, I guess that's actually where my original confusion came from about, does it apply to just discharge into MS4 or other discharges? Yeah, no, that you, that is true. It does, it does include that. Um, so that that is in here, and like I said, that also would apply under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, so, in, if if you if that kind of an event was happening, it could actually be enforced upon um, by either by law. Would you like to scroll down Guilford so we can look at all the prohibited activities? Ooh, wait a minute. Exemptions. Are there more prohibited activities or did we see them all? That was all the prohibited ones. Oh, okay. Do you have another comment, Dorothy? Um, not at this time. It's a, it's a, it's a nice big list of exemptions. I'll just say that this is an area, this list of exemptions is actually something that's in the permit itself. Okay. So it's an area that um, we can't change as much. Okay. So that's useful. Dorothy? Is your hand up? I have removed my hand. Thank you. Okay. See the exemption of discharge from landscape irrigation or lawn watering. Right, I, just to note up up at the top um, with the next to where it says G, it says provided that the source is not a significant contributor of a pollutant to the MS4 system. So again, through our investigations of the health of the system, if we find um, areas with high pollutant loads, we, we can still investigate and then these things wouldn't be exempt. Is, uh, oh, I'm interested in knowing if stormwater runoff containing sand and de-icers is, is um, toxic. Well, it, it's not toxic in a sense, but it is. Uh, it can be considered a pollutant. And if we do have high loads of salt getting into the environment, which exceed the requirements, the, the groundwater requirements for salt or so forth, we do have to kind of take a look at it and try to remedy that situation. So it can become a pollutant and it can be something we have to resolve. Is there in the in the sand and salt that that residents get from the DPW? Uh, is there more in there other than sand and salt? Other chemicals? There's a de-icing agent which is made from magnesium chloride and um, a byproduct of different types of brewing processes, depending on which one we buy. 
Um, and those, the MSD for them show that they're actually not a contaminant right now. They aren't, um, they aren't regulated and they don't pose a risk. What is dye testing? Uh, we, we have little packets of dye that we sometimes put into people's sump, sump pump areas to see where the sump pump will discharge to, or we put it into the sanitary sewer line in the house, like put it in their toilet and see where it comes out to verify where the actual flow leaves the property. Evan? So I, I just wanted to confirm what I thought I heard Beth say, which was that these exemptions are part of the permit and so aren't really something that we can modify or a decision point. Was that, was that, did I hear that correctly? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This. So if this isn't really a decision point, I'm wondering if we should just move on to the next thing that is that we actually have as a decision point. So you're saying the exemptions are required this, yeah, this list comes straight from the permit. Which, which is, it, it, which, it says basically that the, that the permit doesn't apply to this list of discharges. Okay. All right. So let's move on. So are we looking for decision points or are we just going section by section? I just need some clarification here. Yeah, is H, is there, are there some decision points in H? These are what are we're allowed to do to stop and mitigate something. We're allowed to take this action that's in the permit. So this is something that the federal government, state government wants us to do. Move down or? Yeah. I think the best management practices in the notification are actually pretty standard language too, right, Beth? Yeah. Okay. So, so we go to enforcement? You scroll down a little bit, Guilford. In my copy, I have a blue comment, which is not on the screen. Um, and the comment is right here, at which costs first become due. This is in four. And it says in the comment, in my opinion, the town will need to designate the cost. Yeah, there it is, good, okay. So is that a decision point or is that just that you felt it wasn't clear? So that's a comment from the town attorney. Um, and I don't know if, if Paul or Guilford um, can chime in on, uh, he's, you know, he, he's sort of saying how we would end up um, 
It's financial. <laughs> We'll have to look at that. Yeah. So I think that is that a GOL issue? I guess that could be either one of us. Uh, George? I just uh, compensatory action six. Could could uh, Guilford explain why this is here and, and what gives him obviously some leeway, which is good, but uh, and maybe it's just boilerplate, but I'm curious what the role or purpose of this is and uh, it's sort of etc. So, I mean, could he, uh, I mean, he could just do require just about anything. <laughs> Where is it, George? Where? It's under uh, six. Uh, oh. Yeah. Oh. Four, six, um, after, after appeals, it's compensatory action in lieu of enforcement. Uh, the director, superintendent of public works may impose other things instead. You know, could he like 50 push ups? Uh, and no, I, I so what, what, what's, what's going on here? It, it's sort of the same thing. It's, but it would be like we could require them to improve a section of the stormwater system that they impacted, plus a more additional stormwater system if we wanted to. So that's kind of what that is about. And we, we could change the language there to say has to, you know, have something to do with the stormwater system. So it isn't push-ups or something like that. Well, it actually um, does talk about there. At the bottom, it says such things as storm drain stenciling, attendance at compliance workshop, creek cleanups, et cetera. That's at the very bottom. Right, but then just say, um, you know, et cetera, does kind of open the window to <laughs> other things. So to have a statement, other, you know, other I would prefer to come and mow too. my lawn. That would be. I would. You know, that would be what I would say. But, um, <laughs> well, you know, push-ups in the contaminated water might be. Uh, it might be an, an entertaining and educational. Um, just a practical question: Are these appealable? Uh, yes. It says appeals here. There's a section for appeals. Yeah. Which includes compensatory action. Actually, we could we could move those up or reorder those. Okay, but it, it's understood that it's appealable, of course. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dorothy. So I'm assuming somebody has done something wrong. They have been notified that they did. They're given a fine. They say I can't afford the fine. So and say, okay, if you can't afford the fine, then you may do these things. Is, is that the order that it would go in? Yes. Okay. Okay. Any other any other comments, George? Is that a hand that's still up? It's residual. I'll take it down. Um, are we? Is there more here or not? I think that's it. Okay, we made it through both of them. Um, okay, so um, Seems to me that maybe one more time coming back um, with so, a highlighted version. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how you're going to do that. If other people have ideas, please chime in. Um, Dorothy? Do we need to have them come back? That's my question. I felt that we did not have that many decision points and we had things explained and clarified. Um, I could see maybe getting a copy of the document and if there are any changes or adjustments since this meeting to have those highlighted, but I don't see the necessity to have the staff come in again with this. So tell me if that's a, if I'm right or wrong. How do other people feel? George? When we're reviewing these documents, especially as technical as this one is, but I think it's in general when we're dealing with these kinds of things, um, and they have been made revisions, plus we have decision points, I was told that, that at least the previous bylaw, there may be some decision points we still need to discuss. Um, it is extremely helpful to have people like Guilford and Beth present. Um, so um, I don't get the feeling at the moment that this is like just a matter of fi fixing a few, you know, periods and commas. 
but that's just my personal opinion. I, I would like to have them back one last time, especially if they're going to make changes or revisions, and especially if they're going to highlight certain areas that have decision points, we're going to need their guidance. So but that would be before or after GOL works on it? Again, GOL will not touch this until we're finished yep. with it. Trust me. I would, uh, I would kind of agree with George there. Um, not I, a problem. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if we can just, um, and then you know I can figure out with the town manager when when the next meeting will be when uh, it would be good to have you back. I know I know that it's not going to be the next meeting um, on on January twenty fifth, uh, but we can let you know um, which one after that. Okay. And that was a great presentation and great responses. I'm so impressed that you know so much about stormwater. <laughs> it would have been a very quiet meeting if they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like the, re the regulations have actually been going on al almost my whole career. So when I started in public works in Charleston, South Carolina in the 89 or actually 91 that was one of the first projects i was assigned to was some of the stormwater work there for the bigger the biggest communities they started way back then um so it's been around for a long time yeah yeah i'm i'm also really interested in knowing how it inter interrelates with the mvp green infrastructure requirements if if at all you know i mean that may be a separate parallel track i I don't know. But uh, anyway, yeah, thank you very much for, for coming tonight. And uh, we'll, we should probably just move on to the rest of our agenda. Um, which, thank you. Good night. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we don't have much left. Um, I skipped right over the uh, town manager report, I noticed. Does anybody have any questions for the town manager? Um, if not, um, wait a minute here. Uh, we just have our minutes of our, our December 17th, 2020 meeting, which were slightly amended, just, you know, uh just a few little corrections george just one thing i noticed very small but um it, it listed counselors absent and um I, that it didn't make sense to me the counselors didn't have to come to this meeting they chose to come which is fine and we had a quorum so the meeting was declared but people weren't absent um they just didn't want to come or whatever whatever oh, so uh, because it was a meeting of the whole council well, yeah, so I don't see why that's listed. It's just, it yeah, just counts know, as present and then that line should be struck. struck yeah, we, can, we, can, we can amend that if you want to. That's yeah, fine. Just, it seems to suggest that somehow they were you know, not present at something they had to be present at. They didn't have to be present at that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, any other comments about the minutes? Anyone want to move to approve? I'd be happy to move that we uh, approve the minutes of whatever date that is. I don't have it in front of September me. I'm sorry. 17th. Thank you. Um, I make that motion. Can I unmute, Dorothy? That was the second, yes. Okay. Um, any discussion? Okay, so all those in favor, um, I mean, Alyssa, your vote? Abstain. Darcy, yes. Dorothy? Yes. Evan? Yes. George? Yes. Okay, so they are approved. Um, any announcements? In uh, the next agenda, the preview, we are going to have the next um,
presentation on the North Common that's going to be based on our input to the town manager, which is due tomorrow, FYI, and and, it, and we have to do it also if we want the town manager to incorporate our our answers to the questions. Um, so that's due tomorrow, and then I'll compile them. Most, you know, a lot of the questions are just like yes or no answers, and so that should be easy to compile. Um, so we, I haven't heard yet from surveillance technology. They had originally said they wanted to be, come back on January twenty fifth, uh, but I have, I'm not sure that they're going to be ready. But I will be ready with the public way revisions by that time. I just there, there was an issue of getting a getting a an editable version of uh, the document, and that's why that that's late. But we should have that by the twenty fifth. And if we can fit all those things in, we'll do them all on the twenty fifth. Um, Alyssa. I just feel the need to state my hesitation again, as I brought up at the last TSO meeting that I'm still trying to understand our town council culture that says 13 individual town councilors can demand answers to questions. And so if I write another five pages of questions and we each write another five pages of questions, the town manager is responsible for somehow answering all those questions. And that makes me very uneasy. I believe that the request should be coming from the council, not from 13 individuals. And there is actually a really big difference there. Similarly, I hope that your report to Lynn on the agenda priorities, right, which is that separate thing she's been bringing us back to town council over and over again that she said the committees are supposed to talk about. When we send you our individual things, that's going to be five individuals saying what they think TSO thinks perhaps filtered then through the chair's lens, it's not going to be what TSO thinks, it's going to be what five people think. And so that's a different concept than what TSO thinks. So that's just, I think we just need to be clear in our reports, who's speaking for what at any given moment. That's fine. And I don't know if you've looked at the actual, um, questions uh, about the North Common, but it's a little different from the normal request for questions and comments, although you can add them at the end. There are, there are um, I think, eight questions that are the counselors are asked to answer. So that is something that's probably going to be uh, relatively easy to compile. Uh, so there are eight questions. And then the ninth question is, what are your, co you know, additional comments and questions? So yes, that will be a lot of random different questions from counselors. But the, the, uh, the first eight will be, you know, they'll all be, they'll all be uh, aligned with the questions that the town manager put forward in his slide deck, basically. Um, so, um, George? Um, this issue of, of, of individual counselors asking questions of Paul is something, GOL is doing a review of, of the rules of procedure, which we're required to do by, char by our, uh, our charge. So that is something that that I will bring up uh, before GOL and have a discussion. Um, so just I don't know if that will answer or address uh, Alyssa's concern, but it is something that GOL is aware of, and is something that I plan to bring up um, next meeting during our review of ROP. Okay, uh, Dorothy. Um, where is that number one? I've got two two questions. Where is that list of questions on the North Common? Where can I find it? In an email from me to you. And it, it lists the questions. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, I think it's a, 
it's an attachment that uh, has nine questions. Okay. So can you tell me the date you sent that? Because that's the easiest way to find my emails. Or I'll just look up all Darcy ones. Search Darcy North Common. Okay, but did you, did you have any idea what day you sent it? I mean, was it this week, last week? Um, I can just send it to you, Dorothy. No, but I mean, I'll, I'll look for it. Um, okay, so that's um, very helpful. Okay, so I had a comment. Um, and this is, I think, I think facial recognition was separated from the surveillance by law. But um, there's a lot of interesting thing happening right now with facial recognition in reference to the um, activities of yesterday. And somehow I came across my neighbor right around the corner, Eric Leonard Miller, has written a major paper on that, which um, we started trying to read today. So I just thought that was of interest that um, we have a local scholar doing work on that. Um, I think it was on oversight or whatever of facial recognition. So I'm sure that would be an interesting thing for us to read. Cool. We're going to identify all those insurrection people from yesterday. Well, it, um, it, it's the kind of thing where, you know, right, I kind of want to do that, but I realize, am I supposed to want to do that? Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, they're taking photographs and they're checking, they're checking them. So that's, we're going to see it in action and yeah. then we'll decide how we feel about things. I think the guy with the with the horns and the tattoos, he's going to be fairly recognizable. Well, uh, I don't know. His kind of face was kind of covered by his pelts of fur. <laughs> I think they know who he is. Um, so any other comments um, about future agenda items? Uh, so don't forget to send me your ideas about TSO related agenda items if you feel like it. Um, and the North Common by North Common by tomorrow. The others within a week. Um, so I think that's it. Um, uh, do we have any public? Nope. We had public for a little while, but she left. Um, and I think that's it. I think that's it. We went over by 16 minutes. That's okay. Um, all right. I'll see you all. I, I declare this meeting adjourned. Good night, all. Thank you, Paul. Good night. Yes. Thanks, Paul.